He knocks in a crisp white shirt, new tie, collecting his soul for the week. He and his black backpack. Sometimes if she shuts the screen in his face, he says, I'll pray for you if you won't pray yourself. One foot resting atop the other, she doesn't believe him, her and her shutters drawn. Thank you for reading The Pamphlet yes. Man. Thank you. I really liked this poem. Um, one thing I really liked about it was the sinister implication mm -hmm. of uh, collecting his soul for the week, he and his black pack, backpack. Yeah. Um, not to go too far beyond the bounds of this poem, but considering the book contains so many elegies, mm -hmm. um, and the penultimate poem is about the angel of death. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you see the figure of the pamphlet man as a kind of angel of death, or uh, maybe some sort of demon, or <laughs> I don't what, know. What, uh, do you, what, what do you think? What a beautiful <laughs> reading. That is such an amazing <laughs> reading of that poem. Um, thank you for that. I will say that it doesn't live that way in my own mind. Yeah. Um, but it absolutely, with that reading, it absolutely yeah. can live that way on the page or for another reader. Uh, I modeled this poem after a Rita Ann Higgins poem. Oh. Um, she's a wonderful Irish poet. And she had written about, now of course I'm not going to remember the name that they give them in Ireland off the top of my head, but um, kind of like a, a lone guy who would come around trying to collect debts, like a debt collector. Oh, um, so like a I rag and bone kind of person? Yeah, kind or, of. Or I guess they sell things, but sorry, continue. Yeah, so a debt collector yeah, of some okay. type, and I can't remember the exact word, but she had this beautiful spare poem yeah. that really showed the kind of power imbalances between those two characters. Mm -hmm. And I was really inspired by that to think about What's a, who's a person that we see in America where we might, where those power balances would be very different than yeah. they are uh, in her particular, mm -hmm. than in the circumstance she was describing. So obviously what came to mind are, are sort of like door-to-door -door, uh, religious knockers, right? Mm -hmm. And they come in many denominations. Yeah. And, and it is a little sinister, this idea of collecting a soul for the week. And I, so I totally like love your reading of it. Uh, but I was more interested in the kind of play between, you know, who, who is speaking authentically here? Are they both speaking authentically? What's at stake? You know, like how do we bridge a divide or do we try to bridge a divide, right? Mm -hmm. I think about that dialogue where he says, I'll pray for you if you won't pray yourself. That can absolutely be deeply sincere, right? And sure. I am, I, in my missionary stance, I'm going to caretake for those non-believers and try and like uplift them to the kingdom of God. But she can hear that and be like, that's the most cynical, like passive aggressive thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, because there's not a bridge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't have a particular uh, evangelist in mind. Uh, no. Okay. That was my other question because I, I always think about... Uh, Jehovah's Witness or mm -hmm. Mormon mm -hmm. evangelist going door to door. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, you know, I mean, I feel like the evangelists could even be, I could be one of those evangelists sure. as I'm banging on people's doors being like, are Poetry you going to vote evangelist. for... evangelist. Well, I was thinking more like <laughs> climate change evangelist, <laughs> but <too. Okay. laughs> that's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, can I tell you about our Lord and Savior, Dylan Thomas? Yeah. <laughs> can I tell you about the angel Elizabeth Bishop? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Your ass in that chair, there on the patio in the dark of a Wednesday, bark of the bougainvillea eaten silent by loopers, neighbor dogs bark. You're reading a Dylan Thomas poem, not quite by memory, the calm, beloved monologue. I gave you Elizabeth Bishop. I'd practiced in the shower, her words some kind of babble tower of hope. I didn't know losing you would be like Bishop claimed, you remember, you recorded. She said it was an easy thing to master, and that empty chair is vaster than the patio, lit by the lights you bought me the gift you made faster than I could thank you. And how will I thank you now 
your ass as far gone as Thomas, not gently. Stop quoting poems at me. Stop laughter. Stop Wednesdays. And go ahead, brave loopers, chewing on the dark. That's one of my favorite images in the entire book, the mm. brave loopers chewing on the dark. Thanks. I really love that. Just what eats us, but yeah. they're kind of worm or moth or something, yeah. right? Yeah, and... They're a pest. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, and chewing at the dark, mm -hmm. the void. Yeah, I love that. Um, so I know you're originally from the Willamette uh, Valley region of Oregon. Yes. Um, like a uh, specialist, Pelham, um, and he was killed during a tour of duty in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, did you know him very well? I knew Alex through his big sister, Lindsay Pelham, who I went to school with. She and her family lived in Portland and I lived in Eugene, but we actually didn't meet until we were both in a tiny college in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and I had known, Alex was several years younger than us, and I had known him peripherally for a few years um, before he was killed. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was really important to me as I was thinking about this book and also this particular poem to think about what are the ways that I as a civilian have been touched by this forever war and mm -hmm. losing Alex was uh, definitely one of the ones that was closest to home. Yeah. Did you did you talk about poetry with him? Did you uh, exchange poems ever or? That's a great question. So here's <laughs> where the line between like fiction and real life diverge, yeah. right? Uh, no, 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 yeah. Oh. Uh, but I love that you put that you incorporate it. Thanks. Um, so it's filled with a lot of familiar um, grief po poems mm -hmm. um, by Auden, by Thomas, by Bishop. Um, and so when we grieve, we're flooded by these uh, memories of the deceased, and then those memories blend with fragments or verses or images, yeah. um, sounds. Mm -hmm. um, that we've loved and often repeated in our lives. And if we're poets, it's usually poetry related. Oh my God, it's so true. <laughs> um, and so I, I like how that reminded me that grief is really a sensory experience mm -hmm. and um, doesn't necessarily exist within the confines of a single poem. Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about your experience with grief and poetry and uh, the poets that you use oh, yeah. in this poem? I think a lot about grief. I think mm -hmm. that part of that is that I'm a melancholy person and that's what draws me to poetry. And I am trying to understand grief as a metaphor. Like what mm -hmm. are our metaphors for grief and, and how do those metaphors interact with us in different times? And what language do we need to use to be able to access those metaphors and like get them out of our bodies and away from us? Mm -hmm. um, I think that Elizabeth Bishop was a really useful model for me for that because was particularly that poem, One Art, which this poem mm -hmm. definitely is built on that foundation. Um, the Master, vaster. Exactly, yes, like yeah. literally <laughs> using the sounds from that poem. Because yeah, I love that, yeah. She, that, the music of a villanelle really is obsessive and it turns and it kind of grinds and the way that grief can kind of grind us, right? Like we move through grief in ways that can be musical because they're repetitive. And mm -hmm. so by being able to borrow her language and her sounds, I yeah. feel like that was a really useful way to help shape this poem. Although it's not, I wouldn't even categorize it as a loose villanelle. It's more like I thought of a villanelle as I was writing this poem. And that's as close as we got to that's it. That's legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? That's how the creative process <laughs> <Yeah>. works. <laughs> um, so do you still find yourself returning to these poets, Bishop mm -hmm. and Thomas? Or also, I guess maybe a similar question would be, do you find when you are experiencing grief, maybe you're reading other poets and your grief finds a way into like the crevices yeah. of poems that aren't necessarily oriented towards grief oh, that's without really your perspective? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I, I do return to poems. Uh, One Art is a poem that I carry with me. I love that poem. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm 
I often, instead of going to poems that aren't about grief to like let my sadness seep into them, yeah. I'm more interested in going to work that is that's that like can hold the weight of my sorrow. So, yeah. um, Maggie, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm Maggie Nelson's Bluettes. Um, that book like saved me when I was so sad. Yeah. And it's another very obsessive book. Have you read this book? I haven't read that one. No. It is so great, and it's like a tiny book of what is maybe prose poetry, mm -hmm. sectioned off, just numbered, and it's just obsessing about the idea of blue and looking at things that are blue in the world and studying the history of the color of blue and then just it is permeated with sorrow and so that was a book that I was like oh good this book is so sad it's giving me permission to feel all the sadness that I need to feel yeah and then I also think I, I do turn to, to kind of obsessive forms so yes. that's a very obsessive book one art yes. is kind of an obsessive poem and then another book that I love that is not really a grief book, mm -hmm. but is deeply obsessive, is this wonderful hybrid text by Jenny Booley called Not Merely Because of the Unknown That Was Stalking Towards Them. Oh, It's a Peter Pan retelling from okay. Wendy's perspective, and it uses a lot of borrowed language from the um, Neverland Stories by J.M. Mm -hmm. Barry, and it is so musical and oh. lyric and it just repeats and repeats and these phrases keep happening. And when I read that book and I return to that book often, I'll just read a few pages here and there just yeah. to like kind of refresh my ability to use yes. repetition. Like yeah. that is so educational for me and then I'm able to bring that to my own poems. I really wow. got the bit between my teeth there. I'm sorry. I'm really excited to talk oh, about no. things that are sad and obsessive. <laughs> I love it. You, you're making me think of the obsessive works that I like. Like, uh, Louise Gluck. Oh, yeah. And um, Richard Sykin's Crush. Mm. I love He's that book. He's so yeah. good. Yeah. You are at 20, a man. You fight with bullets. It's too bright hot to read. The monotony of waiting bent only by more waiting. And your lieutenant mutters, oh, God, please, someone shoot at us today. Three weeks with no fire. The book's spine broken, so when open, it lies flat on your chest like shrunken, misplaced wings. Your brothers play ga card games out of bright, hot boredom. Some you love return. You'll greet them with a fist to solar plexus, generous sweep of boot to shin, blood out, blood in. It's a kind of wisdom. Three weeks, no fire. You're lying on your bunk, boots on, tracing the spine of Harry Potter. Next to you, rifle rests on dark green blanket, like it dreams of rivers, red-haired women. Like it will wake in the early morning, twist with thirst, desire, like when asked how many bullets were there, it might answer, as many as there were stars in the sky. Three weeks. No fire. You know, it's interesting to think about that last stanza, as, as many bullets as there were stars in the sky, because I hadn't thought about this before, but there's so many more bullets. Because there's only 6,000 stars in the visible universe, yeah. like just looking from Earth like with your naked eye. So mm -hmm. just think like how many bullets there have been compared to that, because it seems so vast, but it's not. It's like, wow, we're a destructive, <laughs> we're destructive like, beings. <laughs> it's a conceivable number. Yeah. And the number of bullets is probably actually, we are incapable of imagining it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, completely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's very sad. <laughs> it is very sad. Yes. Um, and so I like how you use repetition in the poem um, to reinforce uh, the monotony, the mm -hmm. unromantic monotony of military life. Yes. Um, and so I thank you for that because that is something that we so often don't think of. No, we love outside. to glamorize it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Just similar to how the vision of the soldiers, I'm sure, in the poem, they're mm -hmm. itching for a fight. Yeah. Um, and then you choose to use Harry Potter. Um, as 
the book and the poem. And I guess I'm wondering why you chose that particular text or if there was a particular volume of mm -hmm. that series that, uh, that you wanted to use for some reason. I really knew I wanted to use Harry Potter generally because I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of a touchstone series for people of our generation, totally, generation yeah. below us, where if we think about who's telling the story of growing up, it is J.K. Rowling at, through that story. Like almost everyone exactly. knows that story. Yeah. Yeah. It's become a universal reference. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, it wasn't super important to name the volume, although I definitely had a volume in mind and in fact, two stanzas about it in this oh, poem yeah. in an earlier draft. Um, because I really, it was important to me as I was drafting the poem to really make it clear about this idea of like a loss of innocence and to tie the metaphor of what Harry goes through to what this soldier is experiencing. And then as the poem sort of sharpened, it became less necessary. Sure, I wanna say that I love that image of the misplaced wings, mm, the shrunken thanks. misplaced wings, yeah. um, because to me, reading is a form of escape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this person is in this war zone and yeah. on, the, on the border between childhood and adulthood mm -hmm. and considering what it is to be a man. Yeah. And to me, it seemed like the wings were uh, a means of escape, but one that was not really an option. It was mm -hmm. uh, the escape could not occur uh, no. truly. So I'm wondering to you, how did you think conceive of this image, or um, if that's in line with what you were thinking while you were writing it? That's a great reading. I think that it was really important to me to have the book be represented physically. And mm -hmm. as a lifelong reader, of yeah. course, like that's one of the ways that a book can be part of our body is that it lays on our chest as we fall asleep mm -hmm. or as we kind of move our brains into other places. I think that the wings were also important because I was interested in thinking about this idea of innocence or moral clarity, which yeah. I think is something that we bring culturally to the work of our military that yeah. I think is often shrunken and misplaced. Yeah. Understanding of, of the work that is being done, sort of. Reductive and yeah, absolutely. romantic, yeah. And that as this boy is becoming a man or has become a man based on whatever markers of manhood we have, that he's becoming an adult that it becomes more complicated. The world becomes a more complicated place to navigate, and he mm -hmm. certainly is involved in in a place where there's not that like clarity that would allow for these outstretched uh, white angel wings. Yeah, they don't exist. They don't exist. No. Yeah, and it's and it's hard to know that they don't exist. Like to come to terms with the fact that they yeah. don't exist. I feel like I yeah I completely agree. Um, well. Thank you for discussing these poems with me. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. This is awesome. It was lovely. Thanks. Yes.